And I'm sharing in this series some of my favorite stories from the scriptures. And we're going to look at how God was with people through the high mountains and the dark valleys of life. We started uh, just a few weeks ago with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace that the government before them said, bow down or die. And they said, absolutely not. We will not bow down to any other God except for the one true God. And they risked their lives and God saved them and he sent another one in the fire to be with them. Then last week we shared the story of Joseph. An amazing story. What a roller coaster that he went through. And if you missed that, I encourage you to either just read it for yourself or uh, you can pull up the sermon online and just hear how God was with him through this crazy, crazy circumstance. And when his brothers intended to harm him, Joseph's conclusion was that was their intention. But God used it all in his plan for good to save the lives of many people. How cool. Today, I'm going to share with you the story of Esther. The story of Esther. Uh, before I dive in, let me pray. God, we thank you that, that you are the, the way maker. That there is a way that you have for us to take. And even though that throughout our lives, there's obstacles that come before us, that with you, we can navigate anything. And if God is for us, who can be against us? God, I thank you that you have a purpose and a plan for each one of us. That our time here is not in vain. But you want to use us to accomplish your mission. God, I pray that we would join that. That we wouldn't get caught up in the shiny things of life that, that seem great for a, a moment but don't last. But instead, just enter into the story that you're writing. And God, I pray as we look at some of these characters from Scripture, that you'd help us to see their, their imperfections. And that we'd understand that even though these people are imperfect, even though these people at times make bad decisions and dive into sin, you forgive. And you welcome your people back. God, if there's people here that, that are far from you, I pray that today they would come to you and that you would draw near to them and help us walk through life with, with you and with the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as we look at the Old Testament, we kind of get into history. We get into history, and some of you guys are history buffs. You love it. Others of you guys could take it or leave it. You left it in eighth grade, and that's where you want it to stay. But uh, we kind of get into history, which is good, actually. It's good that we get into history. Why? Because what that means is that the scriptures are rooted in history, okay? This is not, as I share these stories, some of these are some really good stories. You're like, oh yeah, that would make a good, you know, children's story. But this is, this is what happened. These are true events etched so deeply into history that thousands of years later, we can still share the, the details of these events. And we can figure out when this happened and what the world was like back then. So that's why the details of the situation in which the story arrives is, is helpful. When we looked at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and we studied, we studied Daniel last uh, winter. And when we look at that time period, that was around 600 B.C. And Babylon were the rulers of the Middle East. It was the Syrians, but Babylon with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and his father, they took over the Syrians. Now Babylon rules what we know today as the, the Middle East, one of the most uh, war-torn areas for, for all of history. So Babylon was ruling during Daniel's day, but in Esther's day, the Persians are ruling. They're in power. Cyrus the Great, in 550, started overthrowing the Babylonians. And he took over that, the whole Middle East. And so the Persians ruled all the way to the 300s. The king of Persia in Esther's time 
from 486 to 465 BC was known as Xerxes I. Xerxes I. And Xerxes had a wife. Her name was Queen Vashti. And the queen disrespected him in front of people of the kingdom, so he banished her, the king banished her from his presence and began to search for a new queen. This is not recommended, by the way. <laughs> they appointed commissioners to search every province in his kingdom to bring a beautiful woman into the palace to be the next queen. There happened to be a Jewish man who was brought to Persia during the conquering of Jerusalem whose name was Mordecai. And as you see these stories of scripture, as we find ourselves in kind of the middle of the Old Testament here, the Jewish people are scattered about. They're scattered about. Why are they scattered about? Well, because the Mosaic Covenant is, if you follow me, you'll be blessed. But if you turn away from me, I'll turn you over to your enemies. And so that's what happened. The people of God, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish people, they turned their backs on God, and God disperse them and turn them over to their enemies. So Mordecai is one of these people. And Mordecai has a cousin. And her name's Esther. And Esther's mom and dad passed away. And so Mordecai takes Esther under his wing. And Esther is described as having a lovely figure. She was beautiful. And when the king's search for a new queen began... They found Esther. They noticed her beauty, brought her into the palace, and she won over the king's heart. And the king made Esther the new queen, even though she was Jewish. And in the palace, they didn't even know that. They didn't even know her descent. So while Esther was in, in the palace, Mordecai overheard of an attempted coup that was going to happen. That some of the king's officials were going to have him assassinated. And Mordecai brought this information to Esther. And Esther reported to the king. And the king halted that. And killed those people in, who were involved. Impaled them on poles. And as time passed, an official was promoted in Xerxes' kingdom. All the royal officers would bow down, would kneel down to this man named Haman. They would all pay him respect except for Mordecai. Mordecai would not kneel down to this man. And so Haman was so upset that Mordecai would not do this for him. He wanted to do some research and find out who this guy was. To set this man straight. And Haman found out that Mordecai was a Jew. So Esther chapter 3 Verse 5 says this. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not bow down or show him respect, he was filled with rage. He learned of Mordecai's nationality, so he decided it wasn't enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone. Instead, he looked for a way to destroy all the Jews throughout the entire empire of Xerxes. Exterminate the Jews. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There's a certain race of people scattered throughout the provinces, provinces of your empire who keep themselves separate from everyone else. Their laws are different from those of any other people, and they refuse to obey the laws of the king. Okay? Why are these people different? Why do these people have their, their own laws? Because they're the people of God. They're following God. So they're singled out. So it is not in the king's interest to let them live. If it pleases the king, issue a decree that they be destroyed. And the king agreed with Haman. And he wrote the decree and he sent it out to every province. Kill and destroy, annihilate the Jews. Remember the, the Holocaust? It seems like I kind of bring that up a lot, but I think it's important, another important event in history. In 1941, between 1941 and 1945, the Nazis in Germany killed between 5 and 6 million people. Okay? Okay, think of that today. Okay, 5 and 6 million. We've had 
we've lost 200,000 in the coronavirus era. 200,000 compared to 4 or 5 million. I mean, that's a lot of people, right? Four to, or 5 to 6, excuse me, million people. And I've, I've been to Germany. It's just a plane flight away. And this is just a generation ago that they killed these people intentionally in an attempt to get rid of all the people that were Jewish. They wanted to just completely get rid of all the Jewish people. And it's important to know that the Jewish people are God's chosen people. And the Old Testament scriptures centers on these people. I mean, it centers on God and his story of redemption, but it's through this people. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob, God gave Jacob a different name. You know what what the name that God gave Jacob is? Israel. So when you hear Israel, where does that come from? That was a name chosen by God for these people. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And these people would be the lineage through which Jesus would come and save mankind from eternal damnation. They are God's special possession and through their whole existence, they've been targeted by different nations, kingdoms, people groups to be annihilated and destroyed. Nazi Germany is just one example. But God promised that he would preserve his people. That he's got their back. And they will be there all the way to the end. And that's why it's important. I mean, as we get younger, as these newer generations come up, we wonder, okay, why do we back Israel? Why is so many people in the world against Israel? And why do we back them? Well, we back them because they're God's people. And and we don't want to go against God, do we? No. (laughs) Even if the whole world goes against them, we don't want to. We want to be on God's side. So back to the story when Mordecai learned of this new decree to annihilate the Jews, he reached out to Esther. And Mordecai asked Esther, go to the king and plead for the mercy of your people. Chapter 4, verse 10, Esther told Hatak, Hatak, which in this situation he served as the messenger between Esther and Mordecai. She told him, go back and relay this message to Mordecai, verse 11. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces, know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come for 30 days. So Hatak gave the message to Mordecai. Verse 13, Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment. That because you're in the palace, you'll escape when all the other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place. But you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you, Esther, were made queen for just such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, Esther, I know this is risky. I know you could die. But what if this is your time? What if this is the whole reason that you are in the palace? To go before the king in this moment and save the Jewish people. What if this is your moment? What if this is your time? Imagine, if you will, with me that this year... Tom Brady's in the Super Bowl again. Now, I would say Kirk Cousins, but I know you guys, even being a people of great faith, don't have that much faith. (laughs) So I thought I'd come up with a different example. So let's say Tom Brady. Now, luckily, Tom Brady's on a new team, for all you who hated the Patriots. He's on the Buccaneers. And they aren't doing so good, but don't count Tom out. 
So imagine Tom's back in the Super Bowl, and it's the fourth quarter, and there's two minutes left, and they're down six points, and they get the ball. And they have a chance to run, run the two-minute drill, march down the field, and end this thing, and get another trophy, and go back to Disneyland. And the offense marches onto the field, and they're ready, they're pumped, but Tom's still sitting on the bench. Maybe he's a little old, a little tired. And he says, hey guys, you know what? I think I'm going to sit this one out. You know, I, I'm a little exhausted. It's been a long game. I, I actually, I think my phone might be buzzing. I'm going to go check my phone. See how my Twitter feed's doing. I got to kind of get home early today. I've had enough. And his teammates and his coaches are like, no, Tom, this is it, man. It's, it's two minutes. This is the Super Bowl. You trained your whole life for this. We paid a lot of money for you. <laughs> Tom, this is why you're here. Take the team down the field, score a touchdown, and then we can celebrate. And you have the whole offseason to relax and do whatever you want. But this is your time. It would be crazy for him in that moment to say, no, no. It'd be crazy. Esther, Esther. This is why. How in the world, Esther, can a, a little Jewish girl with no mom and dad end up as royalty? How does that happen? You think that was a coincidence, Esther? You think it's just because your good looks? Or maybe did God have a hand in it all? Maybe God had a purpose. And maybe your time is right now. Verse 15, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Fast. They're wanting to seek the Lord. She's saying, get everyone you can to pray for me. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, though it's illegal, I will go to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. Doesn't that have echoes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Hey, Nebuchadnezzar, our God can save us. <laughs> our God can save us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow. What we're seeing is the courage in the people of God. Where most people would run. We, 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 most people would give up. Most people would bow. But the people of God see that God has a calling and a blessing on them. And even when the situations could not look worse, even when death was guaranteed, they would step in to the fire. See, she didn't have to risk her life. She could have just continued to live in luxury. But she risked everything. She risked everything. Verse 17, so Mordecai went away and did everything Esther had ordered him. Chapter 5. On the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace. Just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne facing the entrance when he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court. All the officials there would have said, okay, now we kill her. That's what we do. Someone comes before the ki king, uninvited, we kill them. It's a death sentence. Unless he pardons her. Unless he extends his scepter to her. And the king didn't kill her. The king didn't. Instead, he welcomed her. Why did he welcome her? He welcomed her because God was 
with her. God was with her. That God was orchestrating this moment. The story was already written. She just entered into it. And God had given her favor in the eyes of the king. And the, he, she had won over the king's heart long ago. And he welcomed her. And he held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter and she was pardoned. Verse 3. Then the king asked her, what do you want, Queen Esther? It, It must be something huge. For you to be willing to risk your life. What do you want? What's your request? I will give it to you. Even if it's half of the kingdom. Anything you want. Why? Because through Esther, God had grabbed a hold of the king of Persia's heart. Esther tells the king, here's what, here's what I, I'll tell you what I want, but would you do this first? Would you throw a banquet for Haman? Remember Haman? That guy that wanted to kill Mordecai? Okay, hold a, a banquet for him. Haman's the one who went to the king and issued this request to kill all the Jews. Host a banquet for him. And at that banquet, I will share my request. So the king does what she says, throws, just gets, uh, invites Haman to the banquet. And Haman was excited that they would honor him in this way. And as Haman is walking around, he sees Mordecai. And Mordecai, once again, does not pay honor to Haman. And Haman is just filled with rage. He goes back home. He talks to his wife and his friends. And they come up with a plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take Mordecai. We're going to build a 75 foot tall pole. And we're going to impale Mordecai on that pole. That's what we're going to do. So that's their plan. And that night, the king, he couldn't sleep. I believe God put something on his heart. He could not sleep. And the king ordered a search of the chronicles, of the records of his reign. And he brought, they brought them in, and the king is reading through what's going on throughout his reign. And in it, he found a record of when Mordecai saved his life. Remember when Mordecai saved the king from that attempted assassination. And, and Mordecai goes to his attendants, hey, what has been done? Uh, the, the, excuse me, the king goes to his attendants. I don't know if I said that or not. What's, what's been done for Mordecai? And they said nothing. Nothing. And at that moment, Haman walks in the room. You think God's orchestrating this? Haman walks in at that moment. What's been done for Mordecai to honor him? Haman walks in wanting to request Mordecai's death. And the king turns to Haman and says, What should be done for the man the king delights to honor? And Haman didn't know he was talking about Mordecai. And so Haman replied, He should be adorned with a royal robe and one of the king's horses with a royal crest. Robe the man in honor. Lead him on a horse through the city streets proclaiming this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. And the king in the moment Haman was going to request the death of Mordecai says, Go and do this at once for Mordecai. And, and Haman is just devastated. And he runs back home, distraught. And he's talking to his wife and his friends again. And at that moment, the king's people took Haman to the banquet for Esther. And they're eating and drinking at the banquet, Esther chapter 7. The king's still trying to figure out, Esther, what do you want? Tell me, Queen Esther, what is your request? I'll give it to you, even if it's half the kingdom. And Queen Esther replied this, If I have found favor with the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people, the people of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves, I would remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Who would do such a thing, the king demanded? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? And Esther 
replied, Haman. This wicked Haman is our adversary and enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. Then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and left, left the place. Went out into the palace garden. Haman stayed behind to plead for his, his life with Queen Esther. Verse 8, in despair, he fell on the couch where Queen Esther was reclining. Just as the king was returning from the palace garden. And one of the king's men told the king, Haman has set up a sharpened pole that stands 75 feet tall in his own courtyard. He intended to use it to impale Mordecai, the man who saved the king from assassination. Then impale Haman on it. King ordered. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. And the king's anger subsided. And the king reversed the decree that he initially ordered. And Esther saved the Jewish people. She saved her people. She risked her life for these people. And throughout history, the Jewish people were vulnerable. They weren't the strongest. They didn't have the biggest armies. But God was with them and God would save them this whole people through this woman, Esther. And as Matthew opens up his gospel, and that's, what we, that's the churchy way of what we call it. It's basically the biography of the life of Jesus. The book of Matthew. First book of the New Testament. You open up to the first book of the New Testament, and Matthew begins the story of Jesus in one of the most boring ways I think I could ever imagine. He starts it with a genealogy. How interesting is that? You're supposed to start with like a magnificent story. That's how you capture their attention. But instead he starts with a genealogy. Even before Ancestry.com was cool, Matthew starts it this way. Abraham, the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and Perez and Hezron and Ram and Abinadab. And Nashon, and Salmon, and Boaz, and Obed, and Jesse, and King David, father of Solomon. And it goes on and on and on, name after name after name after name, all the way down to Eliezer, and Methan, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus called the Christ. See, Matthew understands. That the whole Old Testament, the whole story of the Jewish people is the story of redemption. How God would rescue mankind through this people. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through Jesus. And Esther would risk her life to preserve this lineage. And it was grim. And it was scary and it was dark. I just imagine that moment. How nervous walking into the king's presence. When she should be killed. But God prevailed. And in the end, God will prevail. Um, in November, we're going to talk a little bit about the end of times. But let me, let me just give you a foreshadowing of what's going to come. The world is going to come against Israel. Come against them and attack them in the end of times. But you know what's going to happen? God's people will prevail. God will win. When situations are dark and scary, God is with his people. And he fights for them. And he has a calling on each and every one of his children. On you and me. And he's positioned us perfectly to do what he's calling us to do. And when that moment comes, when that, that time arises for you to step up and take the ball down the field and into the end zone, will you get off the bench and get into the Will you be brave enough like Esther?
to do exactly what God's calling you to do, even if it's dark. Even if it looks like the odds are stacked against you. You know, nothing and no one can stop the Lord. No one can stop his plans from prevailing. No one could stop the Jewish people. Hitler couldn't. Pharaoh couldn't. King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't. The Muslim conquest of the 600s couldn't. King Edward I of England couldn't. The Crusades couldn't. The Spanish Inquisition. Nothing. Matthew 12, 30 says this, anyone who isn't with me, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Are we with God? Are you with God today? Because you're either with him or against. And when he calls your number, will you step up and do exactly what he's calling you to do? Just like Esther. Man, Esther could have so easily just said, you know what? I'm just going to be in the kingdom and just try to be a good witness. You know, God, hey, even, even Mordecai said, hey, help can come from somewhere else. God's going to preserve his people. Why me? I don't have to do it. Someone else can do it. But instead, she entered into the story in Esther. Perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. You know what's interesting about the book of Esther? The book of Esther is only one, one of the only books of the Bible that does not have the name God or the Lord or Jesus in it. And so we say, you you just say it casually, you say, God's not in the book of Esther. It's just, he's not in the text. And sometimes in the story, in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they're standing before King Nebuchadnezzar, it's like, okay, we see Nebuchadnezzar's army, but we don't see your God Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, Joseph, you're in prison. You're a slave in prison. You have nothing. I don't see your God. Esther, all we see is King Xerxes. Haman, where's your God? I love this. I love this. See, it's behind the scenes. But God loves the work. See, even though it's not in the text, God is there through every single moment, and he's orchestrating it. Hey, God, I can't see you. God, where are you? He's with us, and never will he leave us. That God is always with his people. He goes before us, and he paves the way over the mountains and through the valleys in the wilderness and the desert, his plans will prevail and nothing, nothing and no one will stop. Let me pray. God, I love how you pick the Jewish people, the people who are vulnerable, the people who are not the strongest, the people who don't have the most power. The people who don't know where to go or what to do. The people who are constantly imperfect. And God, I love when I look at Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith. When you have all these heroes of the faith, one who murdered someone, one who was a prostitute. Some who just never seemed to get it right. One who committed adultery and murder. People who lacked faith at times. But you showed your faithfulness through them. It helps us, Lord, to see that you can work through even us. And God, you have a calling on each and every one of us. You have a plan and you have a purpose and we don't know what it is. But I pray when those moments arise to step into the story that you're writing, 
that we would step in. And God, each and every day we'd walk up, we, we wake up, excuse me, and declare our allegiance to you that we will not bow down to any other God but you. God, I pray that we join you. If there's those of you, if there's those people here who, who aren't with you, God, that they're against you, maybe they, they don't feel like they're against you, but they're not walking with you, God, I pray that today would be the last day for them. That they would stop working against. They'd stop running away and admit that they need you, God. That they're done with the life of sin and want to live forgiven. God, I just pray that you'd bless these people as they go now throughout their week. Help us to constantly remember you, walk with you, lean on you, and that you would bring us through those high mountains and those dark valleys. That your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. God bless.